Hello and welcome to our first problem in module 10. Now we're into two population testing. First we'll look at means, then we'll look into proportions. So for this problem, we'll go through it step by step. It's our first one, but I want you to see how similar this process is to all of the other tests we did back in module nine. There's so much overlap but again, I have to make sure I emphasize, be careful for the small little differences that do exist between the different types of tests that we do. Let's get into it. So here again, let's, let's erase this because let's make sure that we can identify what kind of problem it is just by reading the problem itself. Because probably our teachers won't tell us what it is that we're going to have to do. A friend of yours has claimed that Subaru owners are, on average, faster drivers than Mazda owners. Although you may not disagree with him, being the young statistician that you are, you decide to gather some data and perform a test. So that's telling us the type of test, right? This claim is that Subaru owners are faster than Mazda owners, right? And this is what we're going to be testing. So I have to keep that in mind. Now, that doesn't tell me if I'm doing a lower tail or an upper tail. It depends on how we define our terms, because remember that was very important when we have two populations. And also it depends on the type of data, because for something to be faster, if our data is measured in speed, well then a higher speed is faster. But if our data is measured in time, well then a lower time would be faster. So we have to make sure that we pay attention to what kind of data we're being given here as well. We set up a radar on the highway and we begin collecting data. After a week, we found the average speed of, okay, now we've got some sample data, 47 Mazdas. Their average was 63.3 miles per hour and 51 Subarus was 65.7 also miles per hour. We know the population variance was 26 for the Mazdas, 29 for the Subarus. Okay, so how do we know what kind of test we're supposed to be doing here? All the clues are here. So I know I'm testing something is faster than, okay, that depends on what kind of data we're given. When I go through the problem, I can see that it's describing two samples. I have 47 Mazdas and I have 51 Subarus. If I'm comparing two samples, I must be comparing two populations. Adding to that, well, I also have those two point estimates, right? I have two sample means. So those are two random variables. Remember those sample means, they're a random variable coming from their two, uh, well, we'll see if it's two, but coming from potentially two distributions, if not perhaps one distribution. But that's our random variables that we're going to be comparing. We also have two variances. So this is telling us two populations, okay? How do we know, is it a Z test? Is it a T test? Because just like in chapter nine, that depends on whether we know the population standard deviation or not. Yes, it's already told us, but let's just see for ourselves. Well, this problem is really giving us no doubt because it's telling us we have a population variance. So it's telling us in words and it's telling us in symbols. It's giving us sigma squared. It's telling us with the symbol, this is our population variance. So absolutely, and this is a two population test where we know what sigma is. So we are going to be doing a Z test. What kind of test is it going to be? Lower tail, upper tail, or two tail? Well, here's our null. Now, we have two populations, so I have to make sure that I define my terms. For now, I'm just going to put down the notation. I have mu, and I have mu, right? I'm not going to put any subscripts on those just yet. I want to make sure I do it right. Our hypothesized value there's no more numbers given, first of all. I have two sample sizes, I have two sample means, and I have two sample variances. There's no other number that would indicate a particular magnitude of a difference. 
We're not saying does it go five miles an hour faster, 10 miles an hour faster. All it's saying is, is it faster? So that there tells me that my hypothesized difference is just zero because we're not testing for any specific magnitude of a difference other than is it faster than yes or no. Now, when I hear that word faster, combined with sample data that is measured in miles per hour. So that means the car that has the higher miles per hour, that's the faster car. Again, if we were given time, I would be looking for a lower time. But here we have miles per hour as our data. I'm looking for a faster car has a higher miles per hour. So when I see that in conjunction with the word faster, to me, I'm hearing an upper tail test that the speed of the Subaru is faster than, is greater than the speed of the Mazda. So I hear upper tail test. So I'm gonna formulate it like this. Now, how do I define my terms to be consistent with that test formulation? I want to see if I have evidence to show that my friend's claim is correct or not. In order to show that his claim is correct, again, I need to show that the average speed of the, Ma of the Subaru is greater than that of the Mazda. I've got this set up already as an upper tail test. It must be Subaru and Mazda. That's the only test formulation that is really perfectly consistent with the way that this problem is being stated. Yes, I could perform a test to see is the speed of the Mazda less than that of the Subaru. I could set it up as a lower tail. But the problem is said is, it, is the, the Subaru is faster than the Mazda. The test, the problem isn't written in a way to see, you know, is the Mazda slower than the Subaru. We know that that's basically the same thing. But it's a little bit different, right? We're testing for a greater speed. So that's how I'm going to formulate it. Now, anytime we have a hypothesized difference of zero, I actually prefer to write it like this and just rearrange our terms so that we can get rid of our zero. I find this is a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to interpret because now I can see very clearly the alternative states that the average speed of the Subaru is greater than that of the Mazda, rather than talking about the difference between them is greater than zero. Okay, but again, either one of these perfectly fine. Okay, now justifier formulation. Well, if our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, I have evidence to support my friend's claim that Subarus are on average faster than Mazdas. If our evidence supports my null hypotheses, well, now we can refute my friend's claim. We do not have evidence to support that statement that Subaru drivers are faster. Okay, now it's all the same as a chapter nine problem. Next step, calculate the test statistic. Test statistic, yeah, the calculation is a little bit different, but again, the process here is the same, right? Our test statistic, now we're looking at the difference between those two sample means minus the hypothesized difference divided by the standard error. So very, very similar, but a little bit different. And again, it's those little differences that make or break your, your mark as far as getting the question right. So when I fill in this formula, the first part is generally straightforward. My, I, I have to make sure that the way I enter the values into my formula are consistent with how I have defined my terms. So here I can see Subaru is my population one and Mazda is my population two because these differences are always one minus two right? So I have to make sure that I'm consistent in, in, in the use of those definitions throughout the problem. So this is going to be the mean of the Subaru, so 65.7 minus that Mazda 
Our hypothesized value, of course, is zero. I'll put it here just for completeness, but of course it doesn't really affect anything. Now, here's a little spot where you also need to be careful. The formula in that numerator, that is my variance, right? That's the variance. Sigma squared is the population variance. What we are given is sigma squared. We are given the variances. I can't count how many times I've seen students will take, okay, there's population 1, 29, and they'll square it because it looks like that's what I'm supposed to do. When I look at that formula, I see sigma squared, and so it's such an easy mistake to square that variance. So be really careful about that. And again, this comes from being careful not to get into a habit or into a routine. And be careful how you use these formulas. Also, make sure that you have everything corresponding properly. So I have the variance of population one divided by the sample size of population one. I've absolutely see students get these mixed up. Again, it's such an easy mistake to make. So we have to make sure everything is consistent. There's variance for Mazda is 26. My sample size for Mazda is over there, 47. Now we can punch through. 63.1 divided by, oh, what happened there? 63.1 divided by 29 over 51 plus 26 over 47. And I have a, a Z score of 2.27. I'm rounding to two decimal places. It's all the same. Go to our Z tables, find our p-value, find our critical value. So we're doing this test here. It's telling us 5% level of significance. We should get into the habit of writing that here as part of our test formulation. So I'm going to come down to my Z tables. I have a test statistic of 226. Again, I always am taking advantage of the symmetry of the Z table. That's why I'm looking at the negative side because these distributions are perfectly symmetric. So the probability to the left of the negative is exactly the same as the probability to the right of the positive. I'll, I'll show you, we'll, we'll go through both here. So two, two, and six. There we go, 0.0119. And this is a one tail test. So that is my p value. Zero, one, let's just call it zero, um, one, two. So we have our p value. Let's, um, our critical value, you know, we've seen this one so many times alpha divided by two. We know that that's going to be 1.96. Let's go back to our Z tables very briefly. And we can just confirm what I'm kind of glossing over here. Where here I can see the negative 1.96, right? That gives us, there's that alpha divided by two, right? So that was my critical value. If we go to the positive side, because again, we're looking at an upper tail test, and so often students, you want to go to the upper tail, the, the positive side of that distribution. And if I see here, okay, 2.26 as my test statistic, and I'm coming down here, Well, then I get this number 0.9881. Well, we have to remember, right? This is giving us a lower tail probability. So I have a distribution, a normal distribution like this. And if I have positive 2.26, well, this is telling me that this region here is 0 0.98. But I'm doing an upper tail test. 
what I want is that upper tail probability, which of course is one minus. And so that's why I so frequently just use the negative because it just skips that one step of having to do the one minus that probability. Same for a critical value. If I'm looking for an area in the upper tail of 0 0.025, I don't see that anywhere. There's no 0 0.025. What I do see is 0.975. And again, that's that area in the lower tail. So if I have here 1.96, this region in that lower tail, 0 0.975, that gives me in that upper tail 0 0.025. So once again, it's often just simpler looking at the negative side of that distribution. There's sometimes a time and a place to look at the positive, but in most cases, I find it's easier just to use the symmetry of that distribution. Okay, so coming back up to our problem, we have our p-value, we have our critical value, our level of significance here is 0.05, our p-value is 0.012. This all means the same thing as it always has. The level of significance is our comfort level towards committing a type 1 error. Remember a type 1 error rejecting a true null. So I'm comfortable with a 5% chance believing that my friend's statement is correct, that the average speed of, of a Subaru is greater than that of a Mazda, when in fact he's wrong. So that's my exposure, that's my comfort level towards a type 1 error, believing the alternative when the null is true. The p-value gives me a measure of my, ex my actual exposure to a type 1 error. If the null is true and if I choose to reject it, well, that's my chance of committing a type 1 error. I'm going to go ahead and reject it because I'm comfortable with the 5% chance. My exposure to a type 1 is far less than 5%. So I will take that chance because it's so much smaller than what I'm comfortable with. So we reject based on the p-value and on the critical value. Our evidence does support the alternative, which means, as my interpretation, we have evidence to support that my friend's claim is perfectly valid. That on average, Subaru drivers or Subaru owners, I'm assuming that they're the driver, Subaru owners are on average faster than Mazda owners. Good, and that's it. That's all there is to it. So I, I hope you guys see the similarities in this process, right? But then we have to watch out for some of these little differences, right? The notation is important. Realizing we're testing for a difference, whether it's zero or if there's some magnitude of a difference. And knowing which formula to use and knowing how to use it, right? Because again, I often see students wanting to square those variances just because you see that square in the formula. So it's an easy mistake to make. Hopefully you guys won't make that mistake. Okay, well, I hope that was helpful. Thank you all for watching again. Take care. Bye-bye.